a separate playlist for this class, as well as everything is recorded by the Panopticon world we now live in at MTSU. Um, by this, and you've got the video link at the top of the D2L webpage. Um, I use the, I've been using, putting stuff up on YouTube for over 10 years. I liked it better than this because the quality, frankly, is better. Um, and so that, you know, if you miss class, you'll be able to pull stuff up on either YouTube or the Panopto stuff, okay? Your responsibility to keep track. So, obviously, if you miss class, don't send me an email. Hey, what did I miss? Because it's all available. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I started doing the YouTube recordings. What else? Um, if I've got a miss class or I'm going to be late or something like that, I will post a message to D2L by 6 o'clock that morning. So if you're driving... If you're driving from Nashville, whatever the case may be, I always recommend to all of my classes, just check D2L before you come to class. If something happens, I may not be here. Um, students with disabilities, you know who you are, you know what you need to do, so do it. Um, cell phones, laptops, all that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna read through all of that. Uh, you can at your own. I do wanna emphasize two things, however. Um, the the first part, if you're an EMS, if you're a volunteer firefighter, you know, that kind of thing, let me know, let me know as soon as possible. And I'll say, keep your phone out, just put it on silent, put it on top of your desk. If it starts vibrating, flopping around, I'll have a pretty good idea what it's for. Um, but don't, you know, text and selfies and all that nonsense. I've literally had students do that for like every day for the first two weeks of class before. Um, just don't. Um, you know, earbuds and all that, don't do that. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is the more important of these. If you, like right now, have some kind of ongoing family situation, somebody in your family is sick, a loved one is sick, your best friend, your roommate, your, if you're close with your cousins, your cousin, you know, if it's like third, fourth cousin, five times removed, doesn't count. Um, spouse, child, okay? In really sick. Let me know soon. Like if you know now, let me know by Thursday. You don't have to give me all the gory details. Just shoot me an email, all right? Um, And, or, if something arises during the semester, family member gets in a car accident, a family member gets a diagnosis of cancer, a family member dies, every one of those has happened to me every semester for probably the last 10 years. Okay. Let me know within a very reasonable amount of time, like 48 hours. And here's why. I will do everything I can to make sure that you can still complete this class. And that may mean you no longer come to class. And you do everything via the uploaded videos and stuff via D2L. I've done that before for students, okay? You let me know within 48 hours, I'll bend over backwards. I will do everything I can to help you do the best you can do in this class. Obviously, I won't know, oh, don't worry about it. it quiz doesn't matter, exams don't. I won't do that, okay? But, big, big, big but. If something happens now, or by the end of January, and you wait till the end of April, you dug your grave. And I've had students do that. I've, I can think of one student, one fall semester, something happened in September, the student didn't let me know until after Thanksgiving. Why the student was no longer around. And I'd send emails, wouldn't get a response. And I'm like, it's too late at that point, okay? So, just let me know. Keep, just keep informed. If you get an email from me, you know, the courteous thing to do is to respond, which is why I try to respond as quickly as possible. Um, just keep me in the loop, and again, I'll do whatever. And it may be where I'll say, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this class isn't important. Being with your family member who may be dying at the hospital, that's something you'll remember the rest of your life, or that's something you'll not remember and wish you had. 
Okay, so just, um, you know, priorities. Keep what's important important. Um, all the other stuff is about, you know, using laptops, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't believe me, click on the links and read some of the articles about how taking notes by hand is much more, not efficient, because I know it's not more efficient, uh, is, is much better for retention than taking notes this way, okay? What else? Obviously, don't cheat and all that kind of stuff. Um, all the quizzes and exams, by the way, will be on D2L, okay? Um, oh, attendance. I won't take daily attendance. Well, I probably will for the first couple of weeks because of the federal government breathing down our necks. Because if you get student aid, then they own you. You may not think that, but you are owned. Okay, um, and so are we because we have to report all of that. Um, after that, it'll be sporadic. <laughs> and what by that, what I mean is, if three of you show up, yeah, I'm probably taking attendance. Why? Because everybody else is going to get hurt by that. And I'm, this is new for me. This is my 30th year at MPSU, and I'm just now starting this because of what happened last fall. Ever since you know COVID and stuff, attendance, my attendance policy has radically changed. Where I, you know, I don't require you to be here. So if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. But you will, <laughs> after the second absence, kind of start to be penalized for not being here. So you're not required to. It's up to you. You can make your own decisions. But okay. why? Well, last fall, two of my classes, two of the classes that students weren't interested in, the other one was by Tolkien Rowling, and everybody always comes to that. Um, one class had like 20 students, the other class had like 22 students. And the one with 20 would have, on average, about three or four people a day as an 8 o'clock class. The 9 o'clock class had about seven. And so what I started doing, I don't know, October, is every now and then, once a week, maybe once every two weeks, I would take attendance and it was just, hey, if you were here, you got five extra points. And you do that enough times and it really starts to bump the grades up. I don't think, I think in the one class, everybody got an A and it's because there were a bunch of, you know, people getting it, okay? Um, and the other, you know, other reasons, okay? So, all that's to say, two absences, do with it what you want. Have at it. Go get drunk, whatever, I don't care, okay? Or, you know, maybe if you think you might get sick, you know, save them, bank them up kind of a thing. Uh, but after that, beginning with the third absence, you'll just get five points taken from the total at the end of the semester. It's not like I'm going to find a quiz that you've already only earned a five out of go. Well, you make it a zero. No, just a whatever at the end. And all the quizzes and extra credit, quizzes and exams, eh, quizzes not so much. Exams will have extra credit. Some quizzes will have extra credit. I mean, my extra credit's really, usually really generous, like often 20 to 30 points on an exam, possible. Doesn't mean it's easy. It's just, it's there, okay? Um, so, in each subsequent, so if you get a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a tenth and a twelfth, you know, dead grade's going to, you know, you don't want to do that. Um, uh, da, da, da. And again, it won't be every day. Well, first couple of weeks, it will be probably every day, just about. Um, but after that, it, it won't be, okay? Um, paper, next thing in bold, your paper, because you only have one, is due at the beginning of class on the assigned day. I believe that's April 18th, okay? Um, unapproved late papers will receive an F. That is, if you don't get my approval first, which you probably won't, just warn you right now, it's gotta be a really, really good reason. Um, that is not, how did that happen? That is not the correct playlist. <clears throat> I'll send you the link for the playlist. Um, failure to complete any assignment other than quizzes will result in failure for the course. Like if you don't take one of the exams, okay? You would think this is kind of common sense, right? Um, 
Because if you don't take the exam, you get a zero. That's almost in and of itself enough to fail most people. I had a student last fall, athlete, didn't take the second exam. There were three. Didn't take the second exam. Notified him after the exam deadline. Notified him about a week later. Figured he didn't give a you know what. Did the final exam. Got his grades. I'm not kidding the timeline. Got his grades. The Wednesday or Thursday after grades were due. So this is like a week after the end of classes. I get an email. Is there anything I can do to pass this class? I'm like, dude, what's going on? Well, I've really got to do it so I can go to the bowl game. Football player. And I'm like, no, nah, man, you know, look. And I showed him the email. Oh, come on. I'll do anything. I mean, my family really, and I'm like, you dug it. You dug the grave. Time to lay it. Um, so anyways, turn everything in. Um, if you miss a quiz, don't worry about it. More than likely, I'll drop at least one quiz, depending on how many we have. If we have, like, I don't know, 15, may drop two. If we only have five, at most I drop is one. We'll have more than five. I can guarantee you that. Um, grading, real easy. I take the total number of points you earn, divide that by the total number of points possible, total points you earn, minus what might be deducted from you know excessive absences kind of a thing. And you know, and go back up to that, each, the third and each subsequent, I might fudge on that a little bit. That is, you know, I might decide in the semester it's not gonna be the third, maybe it'll be the fourth kind of a thing. It won't ever be first or second kind of a thing, okay? Um, and you know, I get a number when I do that division and it ends up with in this range. If the number is 89.5, you get rounded up to a 90 and you get an A in the course, okay? Uh, it's pretty easy. Okay, schedule. Where am I? Numbers in parentheses are page numbers of the material to be read for that day. Notice I had page numbers assigned for today. I didn't actually expect you to read that. Every now and then, somebody goes, oh, I read all this stuff. And I'm like, nerd. Um, <laughs> but if you did, that's great. Okay. So today, we're not going to actually talk about these pages or this material. I'm going to give kind of an, an overview that discusses this. Right? But then for, uh, what's today? Today's Tuesday. Thursday, I do want you to read these 12 pages, especially that is mentally, kind of especially focus on the material about Abbas Hill and Cadman, you know. Because um, that's kind of the beginning of English literature. And then we have a couple of days, Wanderer and the Seafarer, a couple of old English lyrics, okay, Dream of the Rude, a poem about the cross of Christ, and then five days for Beowulf. So I said at the beginning of class, we'll more than likely be behind as of Thursday. If we go by my first class, we'll be behind today. Because I didn't get through everything that I had on the board underneath this for today. So if we're not behind by Thursday, and if we're not behind by any of this other stuff, which will be a miracle, I can guarantee you, we will not finish Beowulf on February 16th. I've never done Beowulf in this class in five days. Uh, before I revised the syllabus, I had it for four days, and I thought, good God, Ted, you're never gonna do that. Let's at least give them five days, kind of a thing. Ain't gonna happen. Um, I mean, just this right here. If we're not behind by then, we will be behind on that day. Because I won't be able to do the background introduction stuff in the first 52 lines. Because I can guarantee you, we'll be behind within the first 10 lines. Because I'm probably gonna bring in a copy of the Old English version and start ripping apart Roy Liuza's translation. All right? Roy Liuza is one of the premier Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxonists, old English scholars in the world. He's at UTK. His translation, I think, is the best translation available. And yet I'm going to rip it apart. Because he'll, he's going to 
say such money. Say, that's not what those words mean. Okay, so um, and I taught Old English and Beowulf at the graduate level here for over 20 years, 25 years, 27 years, something like that. Um, so I, I really love Old English and Beowulf, which, by the way, is one of the reasons you'll see, just according to the syllabus, I have a month assigned just for Old English. You take this course from somebody else, and this is probably going to be maybe three weeks, and probably two days on Beowulf. Couple of reasons for that. One, not touting my own horn here or anything. They don't know Beowulf as well as I do, except for one other colleague, Dr. McDaniel. She knows Beowulf probably better than I do. Um, and two, it's not as important to them as something else, you know. So you'll find the Renaissance emphasized by another colleague and such. Okay? Then we go to Middle English. That's after the Norman Conquest few days for Middle English. As of right now, I have no class scheduled for Thursday, March 2nd, which is the Thursday before spring break, because as of right now, I've got surgery scheduled on that date for my elbow and hand. That's probably going to change, because I'm trying, I think I'm going to call today and try to find out if the doctor can get me in uh, any time before then, uh, or as early as possible before then. Okay, um, then spring break, and then we do Chaucer, and there's no way we'll do Chaucer in two days, not those two pieces of Chaucer anyways. So there's lots of opportunity to get by. Um, and then the Renaissance and early 17th century. Now, the title for this course is British Literature to 1700. We're not going to go to 1700. So we're going to miss a major, 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 just keep adding on, author, John Milton. We're not going to talk about Milton at all. I hate to do that. I've never been, I've never been able to include Milton in this course. Um, there's just too much other stuff. We have an entire course just on Milton. We have an entire course for undergraduates on Chaucer, which is why I only do one poem or one tale. Take the Chaucer course. Not offered as frequently as I would like for it to be, but you know, that's the reality of the world we live in. Um, so, then the last month is for the Renaissance and early 17th century. Okay, notice three days for Shakespeare's sonnets. I've actually got a course on the books, I proposed it several years ago. I've never been able to teach it yet, probably won't by the time I retire. That's just Shakespeare's sonnets where we spend an entire semester just reading 154 sonnets, looking at the historical background, the context, the whole nine yards. Okay? If you've never read Shakespeare's sonnets, they're wonderful. Some of them are better than others, but you know, pretty much every aspect of human experience, except for war. Yeah, no real war. It's pretty much in those sonnets. Um, the sonnets in bold are the ones we will at the very least, discuss in class. Some of those that aren't in bold, we may not discuss at all. They will still possibly be on the quiz or, um, or exam, okay? And then a couple days for Ben Johnson, a few days for John Donne. My dissertation was an edition of John Donne's Holy Sonnets, and I can guarantee you right now, if I drop anything from Donne, it'll be the Holy Sonnets. Um, again, there's just, there's too much to try to, do in one semester. Um, and then these other ver uh, other poets, and we'll end with Andrew Marvell, who <clears throat> was kind of a quasi-secretary to John Milton. Okay, good poet in his, in his own right, but we'll probably finish that. Um, the final exam will not be on May 2nd. The final exam will probably be posted by the study day, which is April 27th, and will probably be due by something like May 2nd, okay? Um, as I, I think I said, quizzes and exams will all be via D2L, okay? Um, you will probably have 
for quizzes, minimum of 48 hours, a 48 hour window in which you can complete them, probably more than that, probably be somewhere between two to five days. Exams, you'll probably have somewhere between five to seven days to take it. The exam itself, you'll probably have somewhere between 60 to 90 minutes to complete it. And the quizzes will probably be 10 to 15 minutes, okay? So once you start, 10 minutes and the clock will count down, okay? Um, or quiz, or exam, 60 to 90 minutes, but that will be within a, anywhere from a two to seven day time span. And for both quizzes and exams, I will send out daily reminders. Remember the quiz is due, remember the exam is due, so nobody can come to me and go, oh, I forgot, because I'll be able to say, look, <laughs> you had reminders, okay? Um, so just important dates, if you want to drop the class, whatever, um, nobody will. Nobody ever drops this class. Um, paper assignment. One paper, seven to ten pages. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, I'm going to say something about it now, and again, I'll say something else about it later. I want this to focus on whatever the work of literature is itself. Okay? It might be an image. It might be a theme. It might be a character, it might be a scene, uh, yeah, I guess scene might be the right word, not scene in terms of drama. Um, it might be language, the language used in a work or a couple of works. It might be a topic in the work. Okay, notice the emphasis. It's all on in whatever it is we're reading slash discussing slash talking about. Here's what I don't want, and we'll talk about this more later. I don't want to get into it today because we gotta, we're not going to finish what I have for today. I don't want to see some kind of modern thing imported into what we're reading slash discussing slash talking about. Whatever that modern thing is, doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. I've had all kinds of stuff. Um, you probably think I'm kidding. I've had people write about extraterrestrial visits in medieval literature. No, no, it's, no, just don't. It's not there. I had a student once, a graduate student actually, write about dinosaurs in Beowulf. No, just get off all the meds. In a reality, it's not there, okay? Those are extreme examples. You could probably think of some others that I'm thinking and not talking about, okay? Just focus on the work itself. One other thing, the rest of the entire syllabus is all, where is it? Almost the rest of the entire syllabus is all this stuff, documenting sources. And this is, I'll, Tell you right now, this is based on an older version of the MLA guidelines. This is not the most up to date. It's not even the second most up to date, okay? But it's there for a reason. And the reason simply is this. Hold on one second. Turn the lights all back on, sorry. Close that. Turn that off. Yes, we're done. Um, and the reason is this. Every semester, whether I'm teaching lower division, 200 level, upper division, 3, 400 level, or when I was teaching graduate courses, even doctoral level, I would always get papers with inadequate documentation, inadequate citation. Even when I was editing a scholarly journal, which I did for six years, I would get stuff by people who had been PhDs for 20 years where they would have paraphrases and it wouldn't be adequately documented. What do I mean by adequately documented? What does every paraphrase have to have? Yes, it has to have an introduction. Why? Whatever, whatever, and, and they'd be like, what does it mean? 
Okay, you're like 95% of the way there. What am I as reader unable to do if you don't have that introduction? Possibly, but if they have the citation at the end that he mentioned, then that source would be there. Yes? Distinguish what you're saying and what they're Bingo. saying. Bingo. What is that material that's being, I almost said plagiarized, didn't mean to, paraphrased? It's intellectual property, right? Just like this is her physical property, right? If I walk out with this, it's now my physical property, right? No, it's still hers. Intellectual property is exactly the same. You have to give credit to the person who first came up with either that idea or it might be a phrase. Okay? I was reading an article the other day on a blog, and the person talked about this material that was in this article. And then they had a quotation from the article, and it was almost verbatim. The stuff that was before to what was in. I'm like, well, why did you even talk about it before when you just essentially quoted it without having it in quotation marks? You have to be able to distinguish between the writer's voice, that's yours, and your source's ideas, or your ideas and your source's ideas. And if I can't determine that, then, to use the word you used, you actually are guilty of plagiarism because you're not distinguishing the extent to which you have borrowed material, okay? It's not enough to just have the citation at the end. Citation at the end is like 50%. You're halfway there. Now, tell me where it all begins. Because I've literally, literally, I've gotten graduate student papers that have had citations at the end of paragraphs. I'm like, did you write any of this? Or is this all just plagiarized, you know? Anyway. Or paraphrase, sorry, paraphrase. Graduate students don't like it when you say, oh, you've plagiarized, because then they, you know, have hissy fits. Okay, that's all background. Um, so, it's on D2L, print it out, read it, you know, et cetera. British lit in the 1700s. <clears throat> Three main periods. Some people might quibble, they say, might say, no, 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 there's actually four. I'm not sure talk about that. So, the Old English period, also called Anglo Saxon, roughly, that's why it's circa 500 to 1100. Okay? Middle English period, roughly 1100 to 1500. And then the Renaissance, or what's also called the early modern, or what's also called 16th, 17th century, or what's also called the Elizabethan and 17th century, okay? Roughly 1500 to 1700. Okay. Roughly. Now some of these things we could kind of give, you know, if we were talking um, kind of more purely historically, we could give dates like this. We could say, no, really, it's more like 1485. Why? Because there was a famous battle fought in 1485 that signaled the end of the Plantagenet dynasty, the end of the Middle Ages, and the beginning of the Tudor dynasty. Henry VII, father of Henry VIII, father of Elizabeth, Elizabethan period, et cetera, et cetera. That all begins, Battle of Bosworth Field, 1485. Okay? This we could say 1066. And I could draw an arrow and come all the way over here. Why? Because of what happens in the year 1066. So why do I don't why do I not use those dates? Because it's not like on October 14th, 1066, when William the Conqueror, by the way, it's not Norman the Conqueror. I once had a student actually write a paper on Norman the Conqueror, but we know. There was no conqueror named Norman. They were Normans, Northmen, right? When William the Conqueror killed Harold Godwinson, it's not like at that literal moment, everybody stopped speaking Old English and said, tomorrow we speak Middle English. No, Old English kept being spoken for another 50 to 100 years. 
especially in more provincial areas. Okay? So, three main periods. The class is kind of roughly, roughly divided equally, not really, between these. This gets about a month, this gets about a month, this gets about two, three weeks. Okay? If this were an ideal world, I would be able to say, you're all English majors, I'm therefore requiring you to take a semester of Old English, a semester of Middle English, where we could read all of Chaucer, all of Sir Gallon and the Green Knight, and several other major works, and then a semester of Renaissance Elizabethan 16th, 17th century English. We used to have a course here when I first started called just the Renaissance. Went from 1500 to 1700. I taught it one semester and I said, this is impossible. So I divided the course into the 16th century and the 17th century because they're very different. Very different kinds of writing. There's a shift in emphasis, a shift in attitude, a shift in mentality. Like the difference between the 60s and the 70s. You know anything about American you know, culture in the 60s and 70s, okay? So, that's all that. So let's start with kind of the old English, Anglo-Saxon period, but not really. Why? Lots of dates. Notice the first date I have down. Roughly 7,000 BC. There are no English in 7,000 BC. That's 9,000 years ago, for those of you who are math you know, challenged. 9,022 years ago. Um, 23 years ago for the math challenge. So why do I have it down? Because English comes out of a language group, Germanic, that comes out of a larger language group, Indo-European, that comes out of a larger Indo uh, language group, Proto-Indo-European. Proto just meaning first or earliest. Indo-European, Indo, like India, European. If you had a map, if I'm a map, or where I'm standing is a map, where is India and where is Europe? Well, India is probably somewhere down here and Europe's way over here, okay? How, do, how are those languages at all related? Because this group called Today, the Proto-Indo-Europeans, around 7,000 BC, were originally a small group of people, okay? And they lived, we think, in one of two homelands. I teach also, haven't taught it for years, history of the English language. We're going to this a lot in that course. One of two homelands. One of those homelands is the area today, north of and in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So Black Sea over here, if you're looking at a map, Black Sea over here, Caspian Sea over here, in between those areas is a place called the Caucasus, that's where we get the phrase Caucasian from, and they're from an area north in between that. Anybody know what that area is today called? A lot of turmoil right now. It's been gone on for about a year. Ukraine, okay, also called the southern steppes of Russia. Ukrainians don't call it that. Russians call it that, okay? So that's, that's probably where these, this group of people originally came from. The other main thought, main hypothesis for homeland is what is today modern eastern Turkey, area called Anatolia. It's over there near the Caucasus, but it's south of in between the Black and Caspian Seas, essentially. Okay? Bordering on modern day Azerbaijan. Uh, I can't remember how to pronounce it. Okay? One of those two. Well, at some point, 6,000, 7,000 years ago, this group starts to disperse, starts to break up. We don't know why. We don't know exactly why. There are all kinds of theories. And they break up, and one little group goes off over here and ends up in what today we call China. And they dress like Scots, they wear plaids, and they've got red hair because we've got architect, uh, arche archaeological findings from them. Okay, a couple of groups head down south. They go over the Himalayan mountains into modern-day India. All the languages of India 
or Indo-European. All the languages of Russia in Europe, with a couple of small exceptions, are Indo-European. African languages are not Indo-European at all. Semitic languages, the Arabic languages, Hebrew, are not Indo-European all, at all. The languages of modern day China, Japan, Korea, the you know, islands in the Pacific, none of those are Indo-European. But all the Germanic languages, of which English is one, okay, all the um, Romano languages, all the languages related to Roman, Latin, like Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, are all Indo-European. All the Celtic languages are Indo-European. Greek is Indo-European. Okay, so a couple of the the European ones that are not um, Hungarian, which is right smack dab in the middle of Europe, it's not Indo-European at all. Finnish is not Indo-European at all. And Basque, between France and Spain, in fact, there are some theories that suggest modern day Basque is a derivative or derived from the language spoken by Neanderthals. Basque speakers don't really like that because what are you essentially saying? You're Neanderthals, not good, okay? Um, so English comes from the Germanic group that broke off, right? So jump way ahead. Take the history of any English language book. 55 BC, Julius Caesar invades Britain, okay? called Britain then, it's not called England. Invading Britain, why? Caesar's in Rome. Where is Britain to Rome? It's a few thousand miles away. Actually, Rome's down here, Britain's way up here. So why invade? Well, a couple of reasons. One, it's like Mount Everest. It's there. Caesar wanted to conquer. I mean, he conquered everywhere, okay? Why else? Tin, T-I-N, is a known commodity, okay? In oak trees, good for building galleys, okay? Roman ships, okay? So he invades, by the way, Britain at this time is populated. It's, it's populated by what today we call the Celts, just generally speaking, or Britons, B-R-I-T-O-N-S. Not English at all. Don't even think of the word English, okay? So he invades. And when he invades, what does he bring to Britain? Every soldier brings what with him? Not being sexist by him, because they, they were all men. Language. They bring their own language with them wherever they go. Okay? One of the things the Romans did when they conquered a territory is they imposed their language. Not necessarily by having classrooms where everybody would forget their native language and have, you know, learn Latin. Not imposed in that way, but imposed just by sheer force of will. If you want to trade, what must you learn to do? Learn to speak the language of trade. And if that language is Latin, you start to learn some Latin, okay? So this is the first instance of Latin coming to the British Isles, all right? For example, a word that comes in at this point that we still have today is comp, from which we get campus, like the MTSU, campus. Its original meaning, however, refer, refers to battlefield. Well, this is kind of a battlefield, battlefield of ideas. If you want to think that some people like marketplace, because that's much more friendly. Because of my ideology, I'm even more battlefield. Okay. Um, what else? Dish, street. Those come from Latin into Celtic at this point. Okay. So, 43 B.C. Caesar's dead because he was. You know, in 44 BC, Ides of March, 43 BC, Claudius annexes Britain. It is now a Roman province. 
right? So what happens when you become a Roman province? You get a new kind of government. Legions become permanently stable, uh, permanently established. Okay, so now you have a military force. Some would call it an occupational force, etc. Right, and that lasts for over four hundred years. So you've got Roman soldiers coming, legions, the legionnaires coming. And they settle down, and they start to live there, and they stay there for 400 years. What happens as a result of that? What happens simultaneously to all that? What happened just during the five years that the United States was in World War II in Europe? Many soldiers found what while in Europe? Wives, they got married. Wives come home with them. But here, the wives are the local inhabitants. They don't go home with the soldiers because they are home. Okay, So we get intermarrying going on for 400 years. This is 2023. The Mayflower arrived when? Anybody know? 1620. 1620. Just barely over 400 years ago. Okay, so think of think of it in that terms. You've got all this intermarrying going on. So by the time the year 400 rolls around, you now have not a Celtic culture dominated by a Roman culture. You have what's frequently called a Romano-British culture. I mean, we think of the United States as we used to. We don't anymore. I still think. Think of the United States as a melting pot. Melting pot. Okay. 410. The Roman legions are called back to Rome. Okay. Why? Rome's having its own problems. Ostrogoths and Visigoths are attacking. Okay. So they pull in the legions from the far-flung provinces, which Britain was at that point, <clears throat> and what happens as a result? Why is the United States often a quote-unquote occupying force after a war? Because of the phrase, nature pours a vacuum. If the power structure leaves, what's that leave? No power to do what? Call itself the power, or no power to defend those who are there. So why are the Roman legions there for so long? Who, who, who are they defending against? Why are they protecting the Romano-British culture, or who are they protecting it against? Vikings are later, kind of close. The Picts in what is modern day Scotland. See, in late first, early second century, one of the Roman emperors, a guy named Hadrian, builds a wall, or has a wall built, he doesn't personally build, that goes from, uh, if you're looking at a map of England here, you know, goes from over here on the North Sea coast of northern England, southern Scotland, depending on where you want to put the border, okay, over across the peninsula, across the island, I should say, to the Irish Sea. Uh, I don't remember the exact place, like 50 miles. But it's not a wall like this is a wall. Okay? It's a massive wall. Like at points, it's 30 feet wide. I mean, there are rooms built into this wall. Guard houses, the whole nine yards. It's called Hadrian's Wall. You can, you can walk across it today. There are parts where parts of it are missing, etc. Well, he builds that for a reason. Why did Trump want to build a wall across the southern border? Why did East Berlin build a wall separating East Berlin from West Berlin? There are two different reasons, by the way. 
to keep in and to keep out. Trump didn't want to build a wall to keep Americans in. He wanted to build a wall to keep non-Americans out. East Berlin wanted to build a wall to keep East Berliners in. Because if East Berliners had their druthers, they would have all left. And there'd be nobody left. Okay? Hadrian built the wall to keep the people outside, outside. If you ever saw Braveheart, okay, Mel Gibson, about William Wallace, Braveheart was full of all kinds of anachronisms. One of the greatest of which was having William Wallace paint himself blue and march into battle against Edward Longshanks, etc. The Scots didn't paint themselves blue. The Picts did. And the Picts fought painted blue naked. Scared the bejeebies out of the Romans. Because they would come out of the mists of the forest screaming bloody murder and painted blue from head to toe with axes and swords and spears. And the Romans, like the red coats after them, got firm, you know, everybody in line, etc. in you know, the story, okay? So, to keep the picks out, when legions leave, nature pours a vacuum. So now there's a power structure, a vacuum. And everything from this point on, I'm talking from 449, up through 731, everything I'm going to say comes from Bede, an Anglo-Saxon scholar who writes a book called The Ecclesiastical History of the English-Speaking People. Okay? That book is written, completed in 731. Bede tells us all of this history. All right? And here's the history in a nutshell, 1032, 37 minutes left. So, according to Bede, Shortly after the Roman legions leave, an East Anglian king, chieftain, named Vortigern, it's this guy, Celtic name, okay, but he's Romano-British, is having trouble with raids from the north, Picts coming down. And so he sends an emissary to the Germanic tribes. I, we don't know exactly how this happens. It's not like there's a clearinghouse somewhere in northern Germany to all the Germanic tribes to whom it may be concerned. And you send a letter there and it gets you know, distributed or whatever. He sends a message. We need help. We'd like to hire you to defend us. Now, it was known Germanic warriors made good mercenaries. Even the Romans. When they could no longer defeat the Germans, they stopped at the Rhine River. They could not get north of the Rhine because the Germans defeated them in a couple of very, very big battles. Right? So they would then hire the Germans to do things for them. Well, Vortigern essentially hires a bunch of mercenaries. Come, defend us against the Picts. And they say, cool. They come, they defeat the Picts. And they look around there in the East Anglian area, which is kind of farmland, some of it. Some of it's marshy and Finnish, um, F-E-N-N-I-S-H. And they kind of go, you know, these people are pushovers. We should stay. Because northern Germany, mid-England, lower latitude, better weather, longer growing season, not rocky soil, okay? So some of them start to stay. And then they send messages home, those that don't go home themselves, and they say, send the cousins. And you have the beginning of what are called either the Germanic invasions or the Germanic migrations. What's the difference between an invasion and a migration? One's Forced, one's military, one's martial, one's war, and the other one is not. One's peaceful, one is violent. Okay? I'm old school. I kind of still think of these as invasions for the simple reason that much of the archaeological record kind of implies this was violent. It wasn't like the the tribes called the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes came over and said, 
Can't we all just get along? Can't we have this territory and you have this territory and we have this territory and you have that territory and we have all the rest there? It, it seems to appear that what they did was they came in and took territory. Okay? And one of the reasons it appears that way is because we know that Romano-British peoples fled from them. They fled in three different directions. North, west, and south. See, they were in the east. They were coming in the east primarily. Okay? North, Scotland. So how bad does it have to be that you're fleeing back to the people who used to persecute you? Out of the fire, frying pan, you know, kind of a thing. West, what is modern day Wales, okay? Where would they flee to south? Well, you could say southern coast of England. And some of them did, the southwest coast, Cornwall, okay? But many fled across the English Channel to the northwest coast of France. Anybody know what that northwest territory is called or province? Brittany. What's the E ending mean? Little Britain. Little Britain. It's little. My name's Ted. When my mom was still alive, even though I was, you know, mid 50s, she'd call me Teddy. I'm like, Mom, stop. <laughs> you know, Tom, Tommy, John, Johnny, etc. It means little. It diminutives the individual or thing. Okay? Little Britain, because that's where Britain, some Britons, fled to, right? We'll talk about Wales in a moment. Um, so that meant the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes could then settle in that area where those Britons had lived before. The Angles settled, if you were to look at a map, there's maps in, there, in your book. If you look at a map of England, you know, if you're looking at me and the map is here, you know, England kind of comes down and there's a big bump towards the south. And then it goes in again and it pitches out again. Well, that big bump, today that's called East Anglia. Anglia. That's where the Angles settled. The whole southwest, uh, the whole southern coast, generally, each of those areas of it end with a suffix, sex. Not because they were sex starved or anything. That stands for sex. Sussex, the South Saxons. Wessex, the West Saxons. Essex, the East Saxons. And it's not because they each came from areas called South Saxony or West Saxony or East Saxony. It's because that's where the Saxons settled. South, East, West. There wasn't a North, North Sex, North, whatever, because that's where the Anglians were. All right? Terminology is still used today. The Sussex Coast, etc. Okay? Again, this is all from Bede, from his history. The Jutes settled an area today known primarily because of the major town of Canterbury. They settled the area of what's called Kent. It's a little small area, right? Anglo-Saxons and Jutes came from northern Germany, modern-day Denmark and Saxony, northern, one of the northern um, counties, states of Germany, okay? So that's the Germanic invasions. These people are thoroughgoing German pagans. Thor, Odin, Frigg, Freya, Tyr. They believe in Germanic mythology. Okay? Ragnarok is part of their ideology. You know, the end of the world. Don't think the stupid Marvel movie. Just wipe that nonsense from your mind. Okay? But an end of the world, you know, was part of their ideology, right? One thing before I get to St. Augustine of Canterbury, 1039. After the advent of Christianity, so between here and here, beginning probably especially with the sacking of Rome in 72 AD by Titus, Emperor of Rome, Christianity starts to spread. Obviously, it began spreading before they read Paul's, you know, letters. Read the epistles. They're all about missionary work. Okay? Well, with the sacking of Jerusalem, 
a lot of people fled Jerusalem and the surrounding area. So Christians were going various places. They were going down, you know, Alexandria, Egypt, Book of Hebrews, etc., going up to various places in um, Greece and such, as well as, you know, peoples from those areas becoming Christian and such. So they start going various places. We see Christians visiting, not visiting, going to Spain, you know, going to France, etc. They went to England. One of the, uh, the first known martyr, there his name is, couldn't remember his name in my first class. Um, first known Christian martyr in England is a guy named Alban, A-L-B-A-N. There's a town just north of London called St. Albans. He was martyred in the early 2nd century, if I remember right, like sometime between 100 and 150. Right? For a long time it was taught there was no Christianity in England until 597 in St. Augustine. Take a step in the British Museum, go in the It's the northwest, big, wide, northwest hallway up to the medieval floor, and you'll go past the Romano-British period and take a step into a room, and there will be, when you take a step in, a floor about the size of this whole room that is this one big mosaic of Christ. And it dates from like the second century from England, okay? what we call England. And there are Mosaics and things, not quite like that, not quite that large, discovered almost yearly. Some old farmer's out there plowing his field, and he goes a little, deep, a little bit deeper than he or anybody else has for the last 2,000 years and starts turning up pieces of ceramic and mosaic appear, you know, kind of a thing. Well, Christianity of a Roman, meaning kind of not Roman Catholic, I'm, I'm not disparaging Roman Catholicism at all. But it kind of of a Pauline, Petrine, Peter, you know, flavor. Let me put it that way. Early, early church. Okay, That kind of Christianity throve, thrived in the modern ugly sense, um, in Britain from, I don't know, 100 A.D. till 400 or so A.D., some of the Roman legionnaires who would come after 50 A.D. or so were Christians. We know that kind of a thing. So they brought Christianity, and you've got Christian symbols, you've got Christian villas, you've got Christian churches throughout most of you know Britain, not Scotland, though you did have Celtic saints that we can talk about at a later point. We might talk about at a later point, um, etc. A lot of that gets squashed, gets destroyed when the Germanic invasions occur. Because they're not like the Romans. When, when the Romans would say, you know, pre, pre-persecutions, pre-Nero and such, you know, we don't care what you believe. As long as you also give homage to our gods. You can believe whatever you want. The Germanic peoples are kind of more, mm, no. You got to swear to Odin or Thor and nothing else. Just, that's it. You're kind of like the medieval church under like Charlemagne. Believe in Jesus or die. <laughs> uh, and so you have baptisms by the sword, so to speak. Okay? Well, 597, St. Augustine of Canterbury. Again, all from Bede. Bede tells the story that St. Gregory, Gregory the Great, Pope of Rome, guy who came up with Gregorian chant, okay, he's visiting the slave market one day, and he sees these beautiful children, blonde, blue hair, I mean blue hair, sorry, that would be 2023, blue eyed, <laughs> fair complected, you know, children in the slave market. And I don't know if it's through a translator or what, but he asks them, where are you from? And they say, Angolaland, that they are Angles. Angolaland, modern day England, that's where it gets its name from. And he's like, no, you're not Angles. And he makes a pun, 
You are ungulus. Anybody know what that is? Angels. Why? Good Aryan, you know, because they're blonde, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, fair-complected. You're angels. He asked them what they know about Jesus, you know, and they're like, don't know no Jesus, never heard of Jesus. Again, because they're pagan angels, right? And he's like, well, that's not good. You need to know about Jesus. And so he tells them about Jesus, etc. But he also decides he's going to send a missionary to Angelaland. The guy he comes up with is a man named Augustus. His name isn't, or wasn't then, St. Augustine of Canterbury. He'd never been to Canterbury. Okay? Augustine was from the town, if I remember correctly, could be wrong, but I don't think so, of Tursus. In modern day Turkey. The same Tarsus as Paul, the apostle, was from. Okay? <coughs> Greek, in other words. All right? Augustine did not want to go. He'd heard stories about these people who killed Christians. Okay? And it was a dangerous journey because, you know, England's 3,000 miles away from Rome, or Tarsus at that point. But he goes. Okay? And Bede recounts his coming and how the conversion of Christianity, the conversion to Christianity occurs beginning in 597. And within about a hundred years, most of England is Christianized. When I say most of, it means there are still pockets that hold out to the old religion, you know, swearing to Thor and Odin and all those. Bear in mind, most of our days of the week come from Germanic mythology. Today is Tuesday. What is it really? Tears Day. T-Y-R, who is the Germanic god who tries to stop Ragnarok, gets his hand bit off by Fenris Ulf, okay, etc. And then we have Woden's Day tomorrow, and then Thor's Day the next day, and then Frigg's or Freya's Day, whichever one you kind of believe, Friday. So we've got four days of the week named after Germanic gods. We don't have Jesus Day. We don't have Joseph's day, etc. Okay? Um, so he comes and brings Christianity. Skip a few years. 680. Cadman. And we're going to read about, talk about Cadman on whatever day that is. Thursday. Why is Cadman important? From what we know, from what we can tell, he's the first poet using a vernacular language. Vernacular language, everyday, ordinary spoken speech, okay, for Christian purposes. Now, this isn't a course in Christian poetry. It's not, we're not going to make it a course, course in Christian poetry. But what's really important about Cadman is, one, that, and two, because even before that, when, when Greek writers would write Christian poetry, they would write Christian poetry using elevated language somewhat archaic language, or Roman writers. The same way Shakespeare did. See, when Shakespeare wrote his sonnets, when Shakespeare wrote his plays, that wasn't the language of the street. King James Bible is not the way people spoke all the time. Someone would not say, he hath, or my cup runneth over. At that point, they would say, my cup runs over. All right? We'll talk about runs and f in a moment when we get to the Vikings event. So, well, what Kedman also does is he uses the native Germanic techniques of creating poetry for Christian purposes, but for our purposes, more importantly, to create English poetry. He's the first real English poet, even though you can't read anything Kedman wrote and understand it in its either native Old English or into the language it was immediately translated into, Latin. Okay? When Bede's the one who gives us Cadman's hymn. But when Bede wrote this book, it was written Latin. He gave us Cadman's hymn as he translated it into Latin. And he's going to talk about what happens when you translate something, which we'll talk about. Okay? 
And then B publishes Flash Rites in Ecclesiastical History, finishes in 731, which is about the church history of the English-speaking peoples. But it's not just the church history. It goes back to the so-called founding of Britain. Who is Britain named after? Anybody know? Goddess. Close. Brutus. Anybody know who Brutus is? Greek, close, really close. Uh, no, different Brutus. Son of Aeneas, or grandson of Aeneas, son or grandson of Priam of Troy. In other words, part of British mythology is that the Brits are Trojans. The Trojan War. Okay. Homer. All that stuff. They're the losers because <laughs> the Trojans lost. You know, That's why you can't say they're Greeks because the Greeks won. And I have a good, good friend who's Greek and said, well, of course the Greeks won because they're Greek. You know? Okay. S jump up a few years. 787. Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. That's what ASC stands for. In the entry for the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in one of the Chronicles, I can't remember which one, there's five major ones, and then there's portions of others. Um, there's this enigmatic entry for the entire year. It's just one little entry. In this year, three long ships were seen. That's all it says. Take that back. I think there was also fire in the sky. Like a dragon. Doesn't literally say a dragon, it just says fire in the sky and three long ships were seen. What are the long ships? Those are the Vikings. Okay? That's the beginning of the Viking invasion. The Viking invasions actually began 789. The chronicle timekeeper was off a little bit. Okay? So the Viking invasions occur for about a little over 200 years. I mean, it comes and goes, it stops for a while, and you know, heats back up, etc. About a hundred years later. A guy named Alfred becomes king in 871. He should never have been king. He was the fifth son. But his older brothers became kings and died, or became kings and killed. He had one or two older brothers, mentally incapable of becoming king. They kind of got passed over. And he becomes king. Okay? He's the only English monarch that gets the appellation, not the mountain range, but A-P-P-E-L-L-A-T-I-O-N, the Great. I think within 100 years, maybe within your lifetimes, there might be another English monarch that gets that appellation. Because when she died last September, I saw within two weeks of Queen Elizabeth II's death, people start referring to her as Elizabeth the Great. Okay? Alfred the Great, right? In 878, he defeats, he and his army, defeat an army of Danes led by a guy named Guthrum, all right? Hugely outnumbered, Alfred and his men were. It's like 12 to 1. Right? But he defeats them. And he forces Guthrum to sign what's called the Treaty of Wedmore. Nobody knows where Wedmore is or was. It's disappeared from the maps. Okay? But it's called the Treaty of Wedmore. And one of the things that happens as a result of that is the Danes are limited to where they can live in England. And it's essentially north of the Thames River. I'm not going to put it up. I think I've got a map of it. I might actually even have it on D2L now. Um, I'll put a map of it and show you where the, the area is. Um, and they couldn't go south of that. Okay, That was the major part, which is why a lot of those towns in that area today have Viking names or Viking components to their name. Like a word that ends with B, B-Y, is Viking in an origin. You know, when we talk about bylaws of something, well, by, that means community, settlement, borough. It comes from Old Norse, right? Or thwaite or toft. Those are all Old Norse. The other important thing is Gudrun agreed to become a Christian. And Alfred was his godfather. Don't think Marlon Brando. Don't think, you know, Alfred can't refuse. 
Godfather in the sense of sponsor in the religion, the one who will make sure that he believes rightly, etc. Okay? And the real interesting thing, well, I kind of find it interesting, is that this was apparently a sincere conversion on Guthrum's part. He never got involved in any battles after that point. I mean, he, he became, apparently became a quote-unquote Bible-believing you know, Christian and changed. Okay? Then Alfred dies in 899. His son becomes king after him. And then a grandson, etc. 999, you have what's called the Battle of Malden. And we know about this battle because it's recounted in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and because somebody wrote a poem about it. The poem that we have is incomplete. We've only got about 300, 350 lines of what was probably at least 600 or so lines. And the only reason I'm talking about this, this poem, is because it probably has, or it has what's been often called, the greatest exposition of the Germanic, Anglo-Saxon heroic ethos ever. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, Beowulf, Germanic hero. There's a passage towards the end of this, when they're all getting slaughtered. The English are all dying. And an old grizzled warrior says these lines, which I'll say at another point. And it's just like, wow, because this is, this is towards the end of the Anglo-Saxon period. I mean, the Anglo-Saxon period is kind of, in a sense, winding down. And one of the interesting things about the Battle of Malden is it never needed to be fought. The English king at the time had already paid tribute to the Vikings. The local war leader, chieftain, should not have fought the Danes, but he did. We'll talk about that maybe later. 1014, 1016. Alvorad was Alfred's either grandson or great-grandson. I can't remember which. He was the one who paid the tribute. Well, Vikings invade, Norwegians this time. They're all just called Vikings. In the, in the literature of the period, they're often also called Danes. Danes is just kind of an appellation, you know, to refer to the enemies from the north, or they're called heathens, one of those three. Okay? Norwegians invade, led by a guy named Svein Forkbeard. So you kind of get an idea what he looks like. Long, when I used to have a long beard, I would come in and braid it, you know, sort of have two tendrils, you know, kind of thing. Um, and his son, Canute. Svein kind of rules from 1014 to 16. Adelred, by the way, fled to France. And he dies, and his son Canute becomes king. This is Canute called Canute the Great. The Norwegians call him Canute the Great. The English don't. Still kind of an interloper for them a thousand years later, right? Canute reigns, dies, son after him reigns, he dies. 1042, Edward the Confessor becomes king. Edward the Confessor was Avalred's son. Just like a year old when Alvarez fled, okay? Alvarez, by the way, left his wife behind. She ended up marrying Canute. Well, kind of marrying, <laughs> forced to marry Canute. Led to some problems later on called William the Conqueror, which we'll talk about later. Edward the Confessor becomes king. He called the Confessor because of his holiness. Um, supposedly. Some people suggest he's called the confessor because he never had children. It's part of his holiness. He was so holy he didn't have sex with his wife. Why he would get married? Anyways. Um, another reason, according to more modern historians, is because he was gay. And that's, he never had sex with his wife. Okay. January 5th, 1066, Edward the confessor dies. And I just mentioned he didn't have any children. He dies heirless. What do you do when you have a king die without got a child? Well, the Germanic custom, even for kings with children, the Germanic custom was kings were elected. Like Germany had electors. Middle Ages Germany had electors. 
Usually what happened, though, is those electors chose the king's son. That's one of the things in the play Hamlet. Okay? Hamlet should be the king when his father died. But his uncle takes his place. By the way, it's the Lion King. Watch the Lion King, read Hamlet. It's Lion King, just in the animal world. Okay? Um, which is why Hamlet says at the end of the play, my vote goes to Fortinbra of Norway. As an elector, he's saying who he wants to be king. So when Edward the Confessor dies, his Viton, we would call that today his cabinet of advisors, they have to elect a new king. They elect a man named Harold Godwinson. His last name kind of tells you what his father's name was. Godwin. <laughs> Harold, son of Godwin. So if you're Johnson, you're son of John. Now, that John may go back a thousand years. And Godwin was the other guy's father's last name. Okay. Anyway, he dies. Harold Godwinson is crowned king, elected crowned king, the very next day. And then look, about nine months later, you know, you get... The Battle of Stamford Bridge, which we'll talk about later. Why? Because between this and this, something important happened. It's 11.01. I don't think I have time to go into that. No, nope, I don't. Um, it's talked about in those pages that are assigned for Thursday. The background material on 1 through 14, it's talked about a little bit. We'll talk about it a little bit more on Thursday because I want to finish this. The bio tapestry, which is a big long tapestry, records supposedly an event that happened in the 1050s. Okay? We don't know that it's true. And the event was a meeting between Harold Godwinson and William of Normandy. What is William of Normandy's other two names? The William the Conqueror. Who called him that? The French. Anybody know what the English called him? William the Bastard. Why? Because he was both literally and figuratively a bastard. Literally, his parents weren't married, so bastard. Figuratively, he was a bastard. Because he killed their king. Okay. On October 14th, 1066, during what's called the Norman Conquest. Again, no Norman the Conqueror. Normans were conquerors, but okay, we'll stop there. So read the material for Thursday, especially looking at or paying attention to um, Beat's comments about the Abbas Hill and Cadman, okay? And we'll stop there.